So, in the philosophy of religion class, as we wind up the semester, uh, we're going to be talking about this paper by Janet Martin Soskice. Come to think of it, I'm not sure how that's pronounced. I guess I'm making it Soskice. I e have emailed with her a little bit. Maybe I should have asked her that, come to think of it. Um, it's quite a lovely paper. Uh, in some ways, I wanted it to represent feminist philosophy of religion. But you need disclaimers on that. For there is no one feminism and no uh, one feminist philosophy of anything, uh, including philosophy of religion. Uh, so, guys, this was published in the early 90s. And uh, she expresses a, a variety of feminism. I think she em emerges at that point from a variety of feminism um, that you know we might associate with care ethics that centralizes the experience of motherhood, uh, for one thing, and kind of looks at women's experience as suggesting forms of connection rather than autonomy, for instance. Okay, so that is a certain moment or a certain flavor in the unfolding of feminist theory, and there are lots of others. But I thought, like, you know, really the, the kind of um, spiritual orientation that, that she expresses, so is guys, um, emerges from figures, uh, f female figures, uh, women. Um, am I going to fuck up gender? No doubt. Uh, okay. Uh, who do not actually centralize the experience of motherhood in the same way. Uh, earlier uh, figures, in particular, Simone Weil and Iris Murdoch, both of whom, 20th century figures, uh, who really express, um, you know, the same spiritual orientation, which is quite fascinating. Uh, the same account of mystical experience. And one thing we could, we might regard this as is a critique in certain respects of the sort of orientation that James uh, takes with regard to mystical experience, a sort of account that he gives. Um, I'm no authority on Simone Bay, and I have been meaning to turn to her for many years. I've read slices. Um, what a fascinating figure, a, a hero of the French existentialists whom she knew to some extent, some of them, um, like Camus and Sartre, and that's something else because she is ecstatic for God and engaged in a kind of mystical journey, um, beautifully expressed in some of her writings, although she is not a system, she didn't write a, write a bunch of systematic treatises, um, known for more like letters and occasional essays and so on, uh, and for her saintly kind of life, I guess, uh, of self-abnegation and political commitment. Now, one thing you can see in in James's varieties of religious experience is that all that stuff seems entirely irrelevant to politics. You know, if you're St. John of the Cross or uh, Dionysus the Areopagite, uh, you know, I mean, he does not explore the political implications, if any. He, he relentlessly emphasizes the individuality of uh, mystical experience. Um, He's aware that he's doing that, like that's a kind of methodological limitation that he gives himself. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, he might be missing something absolutely central. Um, now, I mean, Simone Weil lived a short life, sickly, uh, a childhood genius, uh, although intimidated by her brother, the even more genius, or at least in her mind, uh, mathematician, by all accounts, yeah, uh, quite quite something, uh, a prodigy as well. Um, interesting complex background. Uh, 
there's a dark, that's too primitive, you know, but there's a kind of death oriented aspect to Vey's um, spirituality that gives it this funky, I mean, this is one thing that the existentialists loved about her, actually. It's like facing death is central to her sense of how you get to God. And by all accounts, you know, there were periods of self-starvation and kind of uh, attempts to mortify the flesh. Um, a problematic and fascinating person, a sort of a nun person in some ways, although not uh, officially, but a teacher, among other things. Uh, Jewish ancestry, but uh, definitely a Catholic by the mid-40s, of a, of a kind of existential kind, um, and expressing it beautifully. At any rate, um, I mean, I, I want to give you a couple slices. This is uh, sort of a collection of her writings. Uh, I was going backwards. Waiting for God, Simone Vey. Vey. Um, these are from her letters to uh, a priest that she was corresponding with on these matters as a fairly young person, um, and she's just, and and she this is described as a spiritual autobiography. Um, as a child, for instance, I never allowed myself to think of a future state, but I always believed of a like heaven, an afterlife. But I always believe that the instant of death is the center and object of life. You don't get this in Murdoch or Soskice. I'm not attributing <laughs> this idea. Um, uh, I, I did post another uh, paper by uh, Beverly Clack uh, from an anthology of feminist philosophy of religion uh, that is about death and embodiment in interesting ways, but we're not really going to get to talk about that one. Um, okay, continuing with Faye. I used to think that for those who live as they should, it is the instant, the instant of death, when, for an infinitesimal fraction of time, pure truth, naked, certain, and eternal, enters the soul. And she, and this she does have in common with Murdoch, uh, thinks of a spiritual and mystical journey as a journey toward the truth, a journey of self-abnegation in the face of the truth, so you can see the truth, so you won't be deluded by your selfhood in a way. Um, so, and this is related to Plato in both they and definitely in Murdoch. Um, seeing the truth is... A dedication to truth is how you reach, I mean, wisdom, maybe immortality for even for Plato, um, and how you see the form of the good. That's also what Murdoch calls it, the form of the good. That's where we're going on a quest for truth. Uh, but, you know, they calls it God. Uh, Murdoch does too, on, on and off. But maybe in, in kind of in brackets, it's, you know, it's not clear what precise religious commitment she's expressing. Murdoch. Um, it is clear what precise religious commitment Vey is expressing, though. I may say that I never desired any other good for myself than seeing the truth, which I think happens at the moment of death. Um, I thought that the life leading to this good is not only defined by a code of morals common to all, but that for each one, it consists of a, a succession of acts and events strictly personal to him. And she does emphasize the uh, individual experience as well. I, I shouldn't say that that's ignored. But the peculiar experience to each person undergoing this mystical experience is an experience of also of abandon, abandonment of the self to see the truth of God or of the world. Um, 
and so essential that he who leaves them on one side never reaches the goal. The notion of vocation was like this for me. I saw that the carrying out of a vocation differed from actions dictated by reason or inclination in that it was due to an impulse of an essentially and manifestly different order. And so again, like, uh, it's a pretty nun like uh, she's expressing her vocation or how she received some kind of vocation or how she interprets the idea of vocation. And she, uh, remember, she's talking to a priest. Uh, and not to follow such an impulse when it made itself felt, even if it demanded impossibilities, seemed to me the greatest of all ills. Not to follow uh, something to which you're called. Um, all right. After months of inward darkness, at 14, I fell into one of those pit fits of bottomless despair. And this is a Kierkegaardian, maybe existentialist uh, moment. This is what drives you to faith, is despair on Kierkegaard's view, for instance. Uh, who those Camus and Sartre were reading. Um, they can't come with adolescence. And I seriously thought of dying because of the mediocrity of my natural faculties. The exceptional gifts of my brother, who had a childhood and youth comparable to those of Pascal, great intellectual prodigy, brought my own inferior home, infer, inferiority home to me. Now, that's pretty bad civil, sibling rivalry, even though she's reading ancient Greek when she's 12, okay? Um, uh, I did not mind having no visible successes, but what did grieve me was the idea of being excluded from that transcendent kingdom to which only the truly great have access and wherein truth abides. Like her brother seeing these mathematical truths, intuiting them maybe, uh, immediately, you know, uh, as a child, um, she sees that, and this is, again, is quite platonic, as um, the spiritual ascent um, to seeing the truth of the forms, maybe, you know, it could be numbers in the case of her brother. Um, I prefer to die rather than to live without that truth. And it's the, it's the incredible personal expression that is part of the power. Uh, Murdoch uses fiction instead, uh, by and large. After months of inward darkness, I suddenly had the everlasting conviction that any human being, even though practically devoid of natural faculties, she's saying that about herself, can penetrate into the kingdom of truth reserved for genius if only he longs for truth and perpetually concentrates all his attention upon its attainment. She may be thinking of Socrates uh, as well. He, she is. Um, he thus becomes a genius too, even though for lack of talent, his genius cannot be visible from outside. I mean, the, as a genius, actually, Socrates. Um, later on, when the strain of headaches caused the feeble faculties I possess to be invaded by paralysis, very sickly life and, and short. Uh, relatively short, uh, which I was quick to imagine as probably incurable, the same conviction led me to per persevere for 10 years in an effort of concentrated attention. Concentrated attention. And that's central to Murdoch, and that's central to Sosice's idea. Attention. That's not something that James quite centralizes, right? Uh, attending to the details of your life, in a way but attending also maybe to uh, the psychology uh, that, you're, that you are. Um, under the name of truth, I also included beauty, virtue, and every kind of goodness, so that for me it was a question of a conception of the relationship between grace and desire. And so, and again, that's pretty darn platonic, isn't it? Truth beauty, goodness, virtue, justice, all ultimately the same thing. Um, and one more little bit of uh, uh, Vey. Um, this is on from an essay called Reflections on the Right Use of School Studies with a View to Love of God. And she was an educator. Um,
The key to a Christian conception of studies, is the way the essay begins, is the realization that prayer consists of attention. It is the orientation of all the attention of which the soul is capable toward God. The quality of the attention counts for much in the quality of the prayer. You've got to be present and aware. Warmth of heart cannot make up for it. So it's not just an emotional effusion. On the contrary, it's a kind of, uh, again, like a little bit of a self erasure or withdrawal to attend to what's out there. That's the way Murdoch conceives profoundly, like the whole conduct of like human life gives it what gives it meaning. The highest part of attention only makes contact with God when prayer is intense and pure enough for such contact to be established, but the whole attention is turned toward God. All right, and but Murdoch, it's interesting, makes it um, uh, attention toward the world. And I don't think that's, in, that's and, 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 and Vey actually does as well, and she centralizes the political, she centralizes attention toward people's suffering. Attending to that is, for her, a holy act, actually. And it's a, again, like it requires a kind of withdrawal of the self. And it's more than emoting. It's attending. It's, it's uh, finding the truth of what's really there. But then that's also your relation to God. Attending to God is the purpose of prayer. And her mystical experience, which she had a lot of. Um... Okay, Iris Murdoch, what a fascinating life this is. Okay, a great novelist uh, and a philosophy professor. You know, met Wittgenstein, taught at Oxford. It's a rare combination of talents. Uh, and she, but she, like Vey too, is, but even more in some ways, uh, is a real throwback as well. By the time she, you know, gets really going as a philosopher, writing about uh, ethics and so on, Boy, she's a Platonist, okay? She's a straight-up Platonist talking about the form of the good. In the 60s and 70s, in, in at Oxford, right, like, uh, you know, everyone's doing analytic philosophy of language at Oxford <laughs> at that time. She must have really appeared to be a, she must have appeared irrelevant in certain ways, but boy, she stood up kind of well, like, because she has all these humanist concerns uh, that seemed to be absent, perhaps, from the philosophical discourse at that time. Profoundly influential on many people as a fiction writer, and, but also as a thinker. And the fiction and the thinking go hand in hand, and like that's it's a hell of a corpus to deal with. Um, but I like this idea of the philosopher as sort of a person of letters, you know. Uh, beautiful memoirs of her life by her husband, John Bailey, also a, a literature professor at Oxford. Is that right? Um, as she declined from Alzheimer's in the 90s. Uh, these, like I say, these quite beautiful memoirs of her life. Beloved character. Uh, fascinating life, too. Um, kind of bisexual. Uh, had all kinds of stuff going on. Um, Okay, a beautiful expression. All right, I'm, I'm reading now from a little section I wrote sort of using Murdoch uh, in the ethics chapter of my own book, Entanglements. Am I an egomaniac? Would it help to be aware of that if it's true? It's true. Would that temper it? Uh, okay, but I, at least I wrote this, so I, I, of course I like what I said, and but it has long quotes from Murdoch, so maybe that'll help. Um, a most beautiful expression of the opposite point of view, um, not that you aren't trapped in yourself, but that you shouldn't be, is the ethics of Iris Murdoch. And this basically comes from an essay called On God and Good. Um, she represents a central ethical experience, a central existential commitment, as the experience of feeling the reality of persons and things and God 
she's a little leery of the term, but she throws it around at times, in genuine externality to oneself. Very much Faye. Uh, but more also on the quotidian artifacts of ordinary life, uh, as well as persons and God. Or um, taking the thing the other way around, she represents the ethical life as an emptying or even an abandonment or loss of the self, selflessness. Quote, it is difficult to be exact here. One might start from the assertion that morality, morality, goodness, is a form of realism. This is deep, man. I, <laughs> I guess I love this thought. Uh, and if you read, you know, more of my stuff, uh, you'd see why. I mean, this really fits with my shit in a lot of ways. The idea of a really good man living in a private dream world seems unacceptable. Of course, a good man may be infinitely eccentric. She knew some eccentrics, boy. Uh, but he must know certain things about his surroundings. Most obviously, the existence of other people and their claims. Got to be aware of that, or you're nowhere near anything moral. The chief enemy of excellence in morality, and also in art, is personal fantasy. I wonder what she thought about the surrealists who were working it during her life. Um, the tissue of self-aggrandizing and consoling wishes and dreams which prevents one from seeing what there is outside one. Rilke said of Cezanne that he did not paint, I like it. He painted, there it is. Didn't paint his own experience. He painted the world. This is not easy and requires in art or morals a discipline. One might say here that art is an excellent analogy of morals or indeed that it is in this respect when it's realistic a case of morals. We cease to be in order or indeed, uh, wait, okay. We cease to be in order to attend to the existence of something else, a natural object, a person in need. We cease to be in order to attend to the existence of something else. Liable to read that in the Upanishads, I think. Uh, we can see in mediocre art where perhaps it is even more. We can see in mediocre art where perhaps it is even more clearly seen than in mediocre conduct, the intrusion of fantasy, the assertion of self, the dimming of any reflection of the real world. Murdoch resorts casually to the most extreme formulation, or calmly to the most ecstatic. I admit that when I first came across that we cease to be, I read it several times in order to be sure uh, that it said what I thought it said. And this does connect to James on mystical experience, yes, the oneness uh, result. Or I thought there must be an adjective missing after be. We cease to be self-concerned or something. But no, Murdoch means that we cease to be. In remarkably rational prose, Murdoch is marking off what might be thought of as a mystical experience, and she's of course going to go on to God and the form of the good. But the basic insight makes me want to try to follow her even to those destinations. One way to cease to be, or at any rate to stop suffering so much from too much selfhood, is to feel the connections. I mean really experience them as fully as possible. In this sense, your excess being is something that traps you in a delusion. You cease to experience the connections to things that are really there. Losing the world and losing other people through the intensification of the self is also losing the real self. You lose the tangle, which is relational, I guess I'm, uh, I have argued. You lose the tangle because you've lost the chords. That connects Murdoch's mysticism to realist art, which she also treats as a kind of pantheist prayer. And she connects this as well to what we could term objectivity in the sciences and elsewhere, which in her account is not some sort of rational procedure, though it might undergird such procedures, but rather begins in an erasure of selfhood. This is her account of objectivity, 
of selfhood. This is how we of of uh, of, of uh, objectivity of uh, knowledge in science, for example, which comes from an abandonment of selfhood too. Okay, well, you gotta see what's there, man, not what you wish to see, not what you expect to see, even, but what you do see. Attention, you need attention. Um, Murdoch, uh, and okay, an erasure of selfhood, a profoundly religious or spiritual orientation. Murdoch would is here by realist art and science. Murdoch makes the loving mistake. Uh, the mistake of loving things other than herself more than herself. Loving reality. Um, one thing about Murdoch's mysticism, not Vey's, uh, and but Soskais has this too in a different form, uh, is it's sensible. It's a mysticism of the mundane. It's a mysticism of craft. In the visual arts, in her fiction, uh, Murdoch's, in the everyday ways we treat or intertwine with other people. Beauty, Murdoch writes, is that which attracts this particular sort of unselfish attention. Quote, another quote, it is obvious here what is the role for the artist or the spectator of exactness and good vision, exactness and good vision unsentimental, detached, unselfish, objective attention. It is also clear that in moral situations, a similar exactness is called for. Exactness of attention, intensity of attention, seeing what's there instead of what's here. I would suggest that the authority of the good, with a capital G, seems to us something necessary because the realism, the ability to perceive reality, required for goodness is a kind of intellectual ability to perceive what is true, which is automatically at the same time, the suppression of self, a suppression of self. The necessity of the good is then an aspect of the kind of necessity involved for any technique for exhibiting fact. The necessity of the good is then at the same time, a suppression of the self. Wait, I'm getting lines mixed up. I have a cataract problem. The necessity of the good is then an aspect of the kind of necessity involved in any technique for exhibiting fact. In thus treating realism, whether of the artist or of the moral agent, as a moral achievement, there is, of course, a further assumption to be made in the field of morals. That true vision occasions right conduct. Socrates, baby. This could be seen simply as an enlightening tautology, but I think it can in fact be supported by appeals to experience. We're connecting aesthetics, ethics, and mystical religious experience, and science, all as being involved in the same project. The more the separateness and differentness of other people is realized, the separateness and differentness of other people is realized, and the fact seen that another man has needs and wishes as demanding as one's own, the harder it becomes to treat a person as a thing. That is that it is realism that makes great art. That it is realism that makes great art. That would be a somewhat controversial statement, yes? Um, remains, too, as a kind of proof of what I'm saying. I, Iris Murdoch. If still led by the clue of art, we ask further questions about the faculty which is supposed to relate us to what is real and thus bring us to what is good. The idea of compassion or love will naturally be suggested. That's what gives, ultimately, that's what focuses your attention. Love. Science is in love with reality, you know, or there'd be no, uh, that's what's driving, maybe. It is not simply that suppression of the self is required before accurate vision can be obtained. The great artist sees his objects, and this is true whether they are sad, absurd, repulsive, or even evil, in a light of justice and mercy. And then I go on to talk about Goya's series of paintings. Uh, was it drawings? Drawings. Okay. Horrors of war. Seeing squarely what's really there, even if it's 
questionable, horrible. Okay, so I think this is a really profound orientation. I'll try to link uh, at least the um, Murdoch text on Moodle or maybe on that video. See you on Tuesday. Face to face on campus, I believe.